For over 30 years, Dr. William Sanger served as the third president of the Medical College of Virginia and then as chancellor and chancellor emeritus until his death in 1975. Trained as a psychologist, Sanger believed that, quote, the college had to be involved in the community and make the community become involved in the college, close quote. He saw the Medical College of Virginia as an academical village where students had access to music, artists at work, public lectures from, from national figures, and intercollegiate and recreation sports programs. A contemporary said that Sanger combined the best features of statesman, politician, beggar, scholar, and administrator, and he had the optimism, energy, and courage to solve the problems facing him. The William T. Sanger Lecture was created in 1963 with a bequest from Dr. Harvey Haig. Dr. Haig directed the creation of Sanger Lectureship to recognize Sanger's legacy to the Medical College of Virginia campus and Virginia Commonwealth University. A graduate of the faculty, excuse me, graduate and faculty member of the Medical College of Virginia Schools of Pharmacy and Medicine, Haig served as the Dean of the School of Medicine under Sanger's leadership. Sanger and Haig were bound by a deep commitment to encourage their students to see beyond the boundaries of their health sciences disciplines and to be well-rounded individuals with exposures to the humanities and the arts. In 2013, the Office of the, Pro, excuse me, the Office of the Vice President for Research and Innovation and the VCU Libraries partnered with the Office of the Senior Vice President for Health Sciences to revive the William T. T. Sanger Lectureship launching it as the Sanger series. The series explores ethical issues and emerging trends that affect research, scholarship, and creative expression in our academic environment. This evening, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Cassidy R. Shigemoto. Dr. Shigemoto is the informatics graduate director and professor of informatics at the Luddy School of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering at, Ind at Indiana University, Bloomington. Effective June 1st, Dr. Shigemoto will join Georgia Tech as the chair of the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts School of Public Policy. In fact, they packed her house up today, so we're very fortunate to have her here. Dr. Shigemoto earned her PhD in Library and Information Science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research expertise is broadly situated in the domains of science policy, scholarly communication and scientometrics, which examines the formal and informal ways in which knowledge producers consume and disseminate scholarship. She has edited two volumes, Measuring Research, What Everyone Needs to Know, and Beyond Bibliometrics, as well as publishing over 50 journal articles on the topic. Her work has been presented at numerous conferences and she has received research funding from the National Science Foundation the Institute for Museum and Library Sciences, and the Sloan Foundation, among others. She currently serves as president of the International Society for Scientometrics and Infometrics. Over the next year, the Sanger Lecture Series will focus on various aspects of disparities, and I'm pleased that Dr. That Dr. Shigemoto will launch the series with her lecture entitled, The Institutionalization of Gender Disparities in Science. Welcome, Dr. Shigemoto. Thank you so much. I am delighted and honored to be here today, and I am very excited to hear that this will be a series that will tackle some of these issues of disparities across the year. So I'm going to talk about the institutionalization of those disparities, both the social institutionalization and academic institutionalization of disparities in science. And I genuinely hope that this is not just a lecture that is one off, but really the start of a conversation that I can have together with the VCU faculty, staff, and students um, over the course of the coming months and year. I will say a little bit about sort of my general areas of interest and what I look at. So I look at whether access to science is equitable. That is, is there equity in who gets to do science? Who gets to be a scientist? Is the production of science equitable? That is, how do we labor in science? What is the way that work is distributed in science? Um, and is scientific evaluation itself equitable? That is, how do we distribute rewards and resources within science? Now, I'm going to talk a lot about race and gender in this talk. 
And so I want to talk for a second about these classifications and to provide a disclaimer on them. I will be using binary gender classifications, and I acknowledge all of the limitations of this. I will be using race categories from the US Census, and I acknowledge all of the critiques on this. And then the ways in which both of these classification systems have been used to exclude and as tools of oppression within our society. Um, but I follow the line of Dignazio and Klein, who have a fantastic book on data feminism, if you haven't read it, who talk about how these tools and counting and measuring don't always have to be tools of oppression, that we can also use them to hold power accountable, to reclaim overlooked histories, and to build collectivity and solidarity. Similarly, in White Methods, White Logic, Best and Zuberi talk about the racialization of data as both the artifact of the struggles to preserve, but also to destroy a racial stratification. So in many ways, we have to acknowledge and critique these classification systems, but they can be useful in order for us to tell a story, to produce a narrative that highlights these disparities that are endemic to some of our institutions in science and in society, and ways in which we can mitigate and overcome them. So I'm going to go through several institutions and talk about all of these ways in which they create barriers to access for different kinds of scientists. So I'll start with doctoral programs. Now the data set that we're using here, I'll spend a moment to talk about because it's a slightly different data set than I think people are used to seeing. Um, we looked at the survey of earned doctorates and the survey of doctoral recipients, which are census of all ind individuals who receive a doctorate from accredited U.S. institutions, and then a cross-sectional survey that has been hosted since 1973. The response rates on this are astronomically high. It's nearly in 100% response rate, which is really unheard of for social science surveys, which provides a really beautiful story about who is receiving doctorates in the United States with a lot of sociodemographic information about them, where they go, their parenting, their um, marital status, their income levels. Um, so one of the things we did is we took this data set and we matched it with Web of Science to look at their publication records. Now, just to give you an overview of how this plays when we look at the intersection of men, women by different race categories, we see that men outnumber women as doctoral graduates, um, and particularly white men who are overrepresented in bio and agriculture and the physical sciences, social sciences, et cetera. The only category in which they do not have the strongest representation is in engineering, where Asian men have the strongest prevalence. We also see white women um, in bio and agriculture and in psychology, um, and very few women of color across all of these domains. Asian women, a little more in engineering um, relative to these things. Black men and Hispanic men, largely um, underrepresented across all domains. Now, if we take that data and we look at publication rates, we can see something very interesting in their trajectories. We look at whether people had a publication or not before their publication, before their PhD. Then we look whether they go into R&D or not. Now, having a publication is a huge predictor of going into R&D at all. And once you've had one publication, we look if they've had a publication in their first job. And you can see the very few individuals who actually go into R&D in academic or in other academic. And in nearly all of those cases, they had a publication before their PhD. And we can see if we throw this in and across different races, ethnicities, and disciplines, we see disparities in who is producing publications both before their doctoral program and after their doctoral program. We might white men and women across all disciplines overrepresented in publication, black men and women, Hispanic women, largely underrepresented. Now, of course, there are disciplinary differences. You're less likely to have a publication in math or sociology than you are in the physical sciences or in the biological sciences. But even within these categories, we see these disparities. Now, those disparities are largely muted once we get to the postdoctorate publications. We don't see as many disparities, and the disparities seem to be largely along disciplinary lines. We can see this if we throw it into a big regression and model all the factors that that pre-doctorate publishing, there are stark differences between Asian and white, black and white, Hispanic and white, and women versus men, with white men outperforming in terms of productivity in all categories before they finish their doctorate, but not necessarily after the doctorate where those are washed out and there becomes a lot of variation in performance. So one of the things we wanted to look at is what is the biggest predictor of that? How do we ensure that people are getting that opportunity to publish, which seems so predictive of staying in a career in R&D? 
And what we found is controlling for all variables, the type of institution, the type of in discipline, that their primary support being a research assistant ship is a really good predictor. Now that makes sense, right? If you have a research assistant ship, you're more likely to publish. But controlling for all things, our Black, Hispanic, and female students are significantly less likely to have those research assistantships once we control for all of the factors of their discipline, their institution, um, and other kinds of undergraduate uh, education levels, all of those factors that we can imagine. So there's creates a path dependency. The moment that they step into their doctoral program, when we choose to award Asian men and white men research assistantships at higher levels, given all variables combined, than our Black, Hispanic, and our women, um, then we start to create these paths where there's a research trajectory for certain populations, and that research trajectory is a more difficult path for other populations. Now, let's say you get one of these coveted research assistantships and you go into the lab. Are there differences in how you're utilized in the lab, the kind of labor that you perform in the lab? So to look at this, we looked at contributorship data. Now, contributorship data, most of you are probably aware of it. This was largely driven by people in the health sciences who wanted better accountability, not just on who was on a paper, but what they did to warrant authorship and the responsibility that was associated with their contribution. So although this was advocated as something to replace authorship, it's largely been something that has supplemented it. So we still have our byline with our authors, but we have a list of people who contributed. Now, years ago, this was placed in idiosyncratic ways in PDFs that we'd have to OCR and really data wrangle in order to get these data out. But places like PLOS, which have provided these in XML format, allowed us better opportunities to scrape these in mass and do large scale studies of contributorship. Um, we'll talk about the credit taxonomy in a second, but the large scale adoption of a standard taxonomy has also been very helpful in trying to understand the contributions to scientific work. So when we first took these data, they were placed in PLOS One in these idiosyncratic ways, but we could bundle them down to about five main categories. People who analyzed the data, conceived and designed the experiments, contributed reagents, remembering that most of these are um, biomedical and life sciences, performed the experiments or wrote the paper. I find fascinating that there were about 20,000 other task types that were unaccounted for across those types, which shows you the wide heterogeneity of scientific labor and the scientific labor that may be appreciated or valued in one discipline, but not in another. But those five tasks take up the sort of the primary task that we see um, across these spaces. Now, if we look at them in terms of these co-contributorships, what kind of task are you likely to do in conjunction with another task? We find that performing the experiments is the most isolated. It's the least likely to co-occur with anything else. If you're only going to do one thing, it's going to be performing experimentation. Now, of course, this has huge implications for fraud and misconduct. When we have the distribution of labor across a scientific team, when that person who's doing the experiments wasn't involved with design, isn't involved with analysis or write-up, um, but we have this bifurcation of tasks that happens on a lot of these scientific teams, especially as teams get larger and incorporate more technicians um, and other laborers on the scientific papers. Now, if we take that and we look at the probability of doing one of these tasks, the analysis, the design, contributing materials, performing experiments or writing, we find that controlling all variables collapse to perform experimentation and men are more likely to do everything else. Now that has huge ramifications, particularly given the isolation of that experimentation space of showing that women are doing a task that is distanced in some ways, that is isolated from the other contributorship tasks and that is sort of bounded in that kind of labor role and expectation as a technician. Now we've updated the data recently since the adoption of the credit taxonomy, which gets a much more nuanced play of this by expanding out the categories to 14 categories. And if we just take a rough look on these, the percentage of male authors and female authors likely to do a task, we see two different buckets, one that are predominantly more male and more female. Our male tasks would be supervision, funding, resources, thinking, software, the reviewing and editing of the writing, the project administration and the validation. Whereas women's authorship is coming from the methods, the visualization, the formal analysis, writing the whole draft, data curation and investigation. 
those are pretty stark differences. Now, of course, you can look and you can understand the role of seniority in there. That has a huge place of men who are administrating projects and women who are doing projects. But when we understand attrition in science, when we look at the unequal distribution of awards, this becomes really shocking data to me. The women are really the hands of science. They're doing the science, yet they're undervalued and often have higher rates of attrition from science before they get the rewards that are reaped by predominantly male scientists. Now we can also look at this in similar way to the doctoral student data in terms of those path dependencies. Does it matter what tasks you're doing and when you're doing them? So if we go back to those sort of five distinct categories, and then we look at your position, the number of authors, the document types, all of this bibliometric metadata, we can start to see some differences across your career stage. Yes, you're more likely to do um, experimentation at younger years, and you're more likely to be writing the manuscript at older years or contributing tools or conceiving of experimentation. So we do see age-related factors in this. But we also see that there are these archetypes. There are kinds of scholars, those who do leadership tasks, who are in leadership roles in papers, and also have experienced multiple roles on the paper. There are those who have specialized knowledge that just do one task, and that is the same task they do across all papers. And those who are always in a supporting role, contributing reagents or tools, um, but not doing as much of the science, but rather resourcing the science. And what we find is that breaks down on gender dimensions as well. Now, men are more likely to do these tasks, and we'll see sort of this difference of men in the scientific workforce. But that distinction between operating as a leader at different stages of the career path increases as they go. So there is a gap in men and women when they are leaders at the junior stage, but that gap gets larger at early career and larger mid to full career. So we start to see this expansion of those gaps in the kinds of tasks with women being more likely to be in a specialized role task, that is experimentation, rather than experiencing the full range of labor distribution. And that creates a path dependency as well. Those who are most likely to stay in science are those who have leadership positions. We tend to see a lot of attrition from specialized and supporting researchers. And those who are specialized or supporting in early stages are likely to stay in those uh, for longer durations of time and never obtain a leadership career um, as they move forward. So let's say you've made it through your doctoral program, you've gone in, you've tried to get different things, you've become a leader on scientific papers, you're conceiving and writing these, and then you go to submit your paper. What happens next? So we did a study of eLife, which I think everyone in this audience should be aware of, so I won't go into that, but it's a large biomedical open access journal that was started with a Nobel Prize money. And one of its goals was to reimagine what scholarly communication could be, and particularly how we could do scholarly publishing. So one of the innovations that eLife wanted to do was consultative peer review. So instead of taking three, you know, taking an article and sending it out to three different reviewers, receiving their feedback, distilling it down in some way from the managing editor and then sending it out, they bring the reviewers together and the reviewers know who the other reviewers are and they share their reviews with each other until they come to a consensus report. And that consensus report is then shared with the author. So the idea is that authors shouldn't get conflicting reports from one reviewer to another, and that reviewers may, may not be able to do those ad hominem attacks or introduce bias in other ways, because they in some ways would be mitigating each other's biases. So Eli came to us and asked us to do an analysis of their data. Now, I will say one thing that's peculiar about it is they also do a gatekeeping function before that peer review. So the managing editor will just do a desk reject. Now, about 75% of the submissions they receive are desk rejects. So that's just the initial submission. Then of those that go through, about 50% go to revisions needed and then become accepted later on. There's a slight decline in that. But really getting through that initial submission becomes very important. Um, and then you go through the peer review process. Now, if we just look at the rates for women here, we see that women don't submit as much as men, about 25% submissions, which is slightly lower than you would expect in the biomedical sciences, where the proportion of male to female authorships is about 35% to 65%. So women are not submitting to eLife at the rate that we would expect given their population in the discipline. But then they're not encouraged to submit a full paper. They don't make it through that initial gatekeeping rate at the same rate as men. And it may seem like a trivial difference, but it is a significant difference there. 
And then when we move to those that are fully accepted, they also don't make it through revisions at the same rate as men, which leads to an overall acceptance rate that is much lower compared to men. Now, these differences, again, may seem very marginal, but when you compound this over time, when you look at the aggregate, it becomes a much bigger issue. When we understand that the best predictor of a second publication is your first publication, of the second grant is the first grant, right? We understand the cumulative advantages that are in science. Getting a rejection here leads down a path of further reje rejection and attrition. So we looked at this by corresponding first and last, and we saw that we weren't observing the same kind of patterns on the last authors, those more junior authors. So these were largely happening around our corresponding, our last authors, those senior PI researchers, um, which could be seen in both ways. It is good that we don't see those kind of disparities among our junior scholars, but they may be less likely to be gendered or well-known, which may mean that the biases are actually more explicit, given that these would be known authors within the field. Now, we also see disparities along geographic lines. Um, the United States makes up about 35% of the initial submissions, but about 48% of those that go to the full space and about 55% of what's eventually um, accepted. We see similar disparities for the UK and Germany. China, on the other hand, makes up 7% of submissions, um, but only makes up less than 3% of those things that are finally accepted. So we see geographic barriers that are coming in, which may speak to different language disparities, um, as well as disparities across different regions and countries of affiliation. So we wanted to look at this in terms of what we expect in peer review. When we talk about peer review, we have to think about who are actually the peers that we're looking at. And when we look at the relationship between those who serve as gatekeeping functions and those who are corresponding first or last, our gatekeepers look a lot like our last authors, um, but not very much like our first or corresponding. And we see that both on country lines and in terms of gender lines. And so in each of those cases, we have more men than we would expect given the population. Um, and we have more people from the United States serving as gatekeepers than we would expect given our population of authors. All right, so to the heart of the matter, what is happening in this consultative peer review? So we looked at three different kinds of groups. What if you had all male reviewers? What if everyone in the room was a man? What if everyone in the room was a woman? And what if you had both men and women in the room? Now, if you have all male reviewers, men have a significantly um, higher likelihood of being accepted. Now, all female reviewers, we see almost the exact mirrored relationship where women fare better. Now, it's not statistically significant, and why? Because there are only 21 papers written by women reviewed by all female reviewers in the entire data set. Now, once you go to the mixed gender, we don't see any difference. And that's what we want. We don't want an advantage for women. We don't want an advantage for men. We wanna see that gender disparities are not playing a role in these kinds of acceptance things. And we do see that having those mixed gender reviews makes a difference here. So this suggests that there's a homophily. Having someone in the room who is matched in socio-demographic characteristics with the author gives them a bit of an advantage. But men are significantly more likely to have this advantage than women are. Now we see the same homophilic bias when we look at country level data as well. Having at least one reviewer from China significantly increases the likelihood that a Chinese author will be accepted. We see the same thing in the UK and the US. Now, where we don't see it is in France. That is where it's really bad. If you are French, you really don't wanna be reviewed by someone from France. So we have a critical review culture that comes in there. And we see the same data for Canada, which I would attribute to uh, French Canadians. And that's my co-author on this paper is Quebecois. So I think we can say that. Now, of course you can say, well, okay, if homophilic bias is there for everyone, then it's equal, right? If everyone is getting an advantage there, but the probability of having someone review your paper who looks like you is very different for different populations. If you're from the US, there's a 91% chance that you're gonna be reviewed from someone else from the US, 30% someone from the UK, 25% for Germany. If you go down to China, there's a tiny percent that you're actually going to be reviewed by someone else from China. So even though homophily may operate for men, for women, for people from every country, there's not an equal probability of experiencing that homophily, which is one of the things that is creating these kinds of disparities. So if we throw all of this into a big regression and we say, what are the biggest predictors 
of getting through that gate, right? Those 25% that make it through the gate, well, be at a top institution and be male. Now, if you get through the gate, the significant factors are be from a top institution, be male, and be reviewed only by men. So these data suggest to us that the gatekeeping function itself is not equitable. Now, what can we do about it? Well, one of the things that we've seen is that when you change the role of the, if you change the composition of the reviewing editors, it also changes the composition of the review teams. So women were more likely to have mixed gender review teams than men were. And if we looked at it by country, we see the same things. Those from Oceania were more likely to engage reviewers from Oceania, those from Europe to engage reviewers from Europe. So there's homophily there in selecting and bringing into the network other people, which suggests that when we change the representation at the top, it's going to diffuse throughout the entire organization as these homophily bi uh, biases become uh, pervasive across all different kinds of groups. Now, so if we've gone through this, we've gone through our doctoral studies, we've labored, we've finally gotten accepted, what does the world look like at that point? Well, this is the male to female productivity by country. And the bluer it is, the more male dominated, and the oranger it is, the more female dominated. And as you can see, it's an excessively blue world. So across the bat, we're looking at about a third productivity by females um, at globally, but we see differences, of course, by country. Now, most of these countries where we see women doing well may be exemplars, places that we could look in for policy implications. So we've taken all those countries and we've looked at all of the factors that we can pull from the UN and UNESCO and tried to understand what are the factors happening in that country that are making women do so well. And when we throw everything into a big model, the factor that is the most predictive is male mortality. Now that's not really an actionable policy mechanism. And that becomes really problematic. And it speaks to something very clear in our data that places where women are doing well aren't because the country is doing well. It's because the country has become impoverished because there's been brain drain or because science or the academy has been devalued and women are left to do that work that has been devalued. And so we have this parity paradox is sometimes we're looking for parity and as parity as our answer, but in many cases, when we create parity, there's no equity. And so we really have to look beyond that. We can't just look at quotas as an end in themselves. We have to actually use quotas to understand how we can dismantle and reassemble this system in ways that are more equitable. Now you may say, okay, but that's at the country level. If you look across disciplines, maybe you'll see something different. Now, certainly we see more men in math and physics, um, we start to see women more in the health and medical sciences and in the health professions, we see a little bit more, some in the social sciences and then male dominated in the humanities. The places where we see highest levels of women are perhaps unsurprisingly for this group, um, library science, nursing, social work, speech and language pathology and other disciplines that are largely related as care disciplines. Now there is a huge history of literature on the feminization of disciplines which talks about how those disciplines became female dominated um, and their relationship in terms of both economic capital and social capital to other disciplines which are male dominated. All right, so we also see differences as I spoke to before about these levels of mobility, where women are moving and how mobile women are in these different countries. So we see a lot more mobility for women in Africa, um, across Indonesia, Thailand, and other spaces where they are leaving these countries in order to seek opportunities elsewhere. Um, we do see this in countries where certain degrees are not open to women, where they are relegated to certain disciplines within the higher education system. And so there's a lot of these inequities that play out in the mobility space. However, we see that men tend to be more mobile overall. So they have higher levels of mobility compared to women. And furthermore, the nature of the collaborations, even if you can't move, the nature of the collaborations is significantly different. So in a place like China or the United States, which have several institutions and researchers with whom you can collaborate, we expect that there's more domestic collaborations. We expect in Switzerland, Philippines, smaller countries, that there will be fewer collaborations. But invariant across the countries, regardless of the country size, 
women have more domestic collaborations, whereas men have more international collaborations. And this has huge implications for their access to the network, access to resources, um, and access to mobility itself. Now, we also see that kind of collaboration homophily playing out. So it's another level of how homophily plays to both create networks, but also to isolate certain populations. So if we look at the relationship between just first author and last author, those dominant author positions, we find that men are significantly more likely to collaborate with other men and women with other women across race lines. So race is not as much of a factor in that, except when it comes to Asian authors. Asian men and women are much more likely to collaborate with each other than with other men or with other women. Now we see also Hispanic men and Hispanic women are also likely to do that, but they also collaborate with women of other races and men of other races as well. And you see that even more strongly and dominant when you look at the all author combination, that is all the middle authors as well, where we see these strong biases towards collaborating with the same sex and um, ethnicity and race. So across all of these things, we see that there is systematic segregation, barriers to entries, ways from becoming a doctoral student, laboring in the lab, producing scientific work that create these global disparities that we can see across country, across discipline, um, and that create certain kinds of resource disparities that we'll talk about in a second. So I'm going to talk about utilization of science. Now, People would expect me to call this, you know, citations. Um, but I find that that's a little bit problematic because for me, citations are certainly not an indicator of quality, but citations are an indicator of utilization. Who's utilizing your work? Who's consuming your work? Who is basing their scientific work upon yours? And utilization has ties to access, which we'll come back to at the end of the talk, and also ties to rewards. The scientific reward system is largely built upon the receipt of these citations. So if we look at it across collaboration types, we certainly see disparities. These papers that have the lowest average citations are those written by women writing alone. Now, collaboration always begets more citations than sole authors on average. But in each of these cases, when a woman is in a first or a last author position, they receive fewer citations than men in first and last author positions. Now, international collaborations have the highest citation rate on average, but again, we see those disparities in terms of first and last. So there's this compound disadvantage that happens. Women are more likely to have national collaborations than men. They're also less likely to be single authors than men, um, and they don't have that international network that men have. And so we start to see some of those tensions play out in the reward system, where there is an expectation of equality, which can't be met given the nature of labor production. Now, if we look at this along race, it's even more dramatic. So this is the likelihood that a surname is associated with race using the US census data. So you will have a given surname, and it's the proportion of people with that surname who are Asian, Black, Hispanic, or white. And what you can see is there are disparities by gender within each of these race and ethnicities, um, where women have fewer citations on average than the men within that same race or ethnicity category. But what is the most horrifying to me is when you get into the 80 to 90 percentile, um, 80 to 90 percent likelihood that a certain name is associated with a black scholar or a Hispanic scholar. And suddenly for both men and women, the citations drop dramatically. Now these are perceived race, right? And we can critique whether we should do algorithmic assignments of race, but this means when you're going to cite and you perceive a name, Rodriguez, for example, which you know is going to be highly associated with a certain race, you would be less likely to cite it than you would to cite a name that has a higher probability of being associated with a white or an Asian name. So these are really troubling findings, especially that steep cliff that we see for Black and Hispanic names. Now, in some other work that we're doing, we looked at the degree to which certain races are associated with different topic categories. So taking 500 different topics across the topic space, we look to see whether Asian men, Asian women, Black men, Black women are more likely to be associated with that topic. And you see that color spectrum along here. So the topics are sorted by their average citations. 
And what you see here is a clear scaffolding between men on top and women on bottom, but then by race as well, in terms of those who receive the highest citations and who are performing in disciplines that yield higher citations. So we have this intersection between topic and citation as well, where Asian men are in disciplines that are highly cited, um, where our Black women tend to be in disciplines that are not as highly cited. And so we see this space playing out in terms of topic distribution, which we'll come back to later as well. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, well, it's just because women aren't citing, you know, aren't publishing in the right venues. If only women were, were publishing in journals of higher impact factor, we wouldn't see these citation disparities. But we looked at this between impact factor, the average impact factor, and the citations. And we find that in many areas, biology, earth and space sciences, engineering, social sciences, women are actually publishing in journals of higher journal impact factor than men, yet men are still receiving higher citations. Now you can say, okay, but those are averages and GIFs are highly skewed, citations are highly skewed. So we've taken this down by deciles. If you look at the journals with the lowest decile, there's fairly little difference in the citations received by men or women publishing in those same journals. But as you move up to get to those journals with the higher and higher and higher impact factors, the gap widens and it's widest at the top, which means that the women who are publishing in cell and nature and science are actually not getting cited as much as the men publishing in those spaces. Now, to me, it's very hard to describe that as a quality differential. When you make it into those journals, you're part of 5% who actually go through the gatekeeping process, your work is of high quality, and yet you're not utilized, you're not visible. People are not consuming, digesting, and rewarding the work that you're doing. Now we see homophily in citations as well. So that comes back into the story a lot about this institutionalization, this stratification that's happening. If we look at the references and the citations made in terms of the continents that authors are coming from, we see great homophily. If you are in Asia, you're more likely to reference other Asian authors and to receive citations from other Asian authors, right? It's a, it's a cyclical relationship there. But we see that across all continents, in North America, in Oceania, um, in South America, you're predominantly more likely to be cited and cite people who are in your same proximity. And we see the same thing if we break it down by country as well, with different variations and different sort of country hubs. But this suggests, too, that that utilization is a much better definition than quality. This isn't talking about the quality of a work. It's the work that you're aware of, the work that you can read, the work that you can access. And so we see this sort of homophilic bias coming in. Those who are most prevalent in the system are going to benefit the most and have an advantageous effects of this homophily because there are other people from their country, from their race, from their gender, who are going to disproportionately cite their work. So this is one of the things that we look into in terms of the levers and the mechanisms and understanding citation indicators themselves. So to close on that, this utilization of science again follows these established hierarchies, these rankings between institutions, the populations of countries, um, and demonstrates the same homophilic effects that we saw before in peer review and other kinds of gatekeeping functions. Now, of course, science isn't the only institution here, right? When we're talking about gender and race, we can't ignore that there are other social institutions, things happening outside of the ivory tower, which are contributing to some of these disparities that we see. So one of those I wanna talk about is parenting, probably driven in no small part by the fact that I am a mother of two daughters who's been home during the pandemic with them. So I've been thinking a lot about parenting recently. So we gave a, a survey out um, with about 10,000 respondents across the world. And we asked them to identify, are you the lead parent? Are you the primary caregiver for your children? Are you a dual parent? Do you share equally with a partner or a non-partner? It could be um, a, you know, other family member or non-family member who is engaging in parenting. Or are you a satellite parent? Is there someone else who has a primary caregiving role? And now probably not surprisingly, women are more likely to be lead parents and men more likely to self-identify as satellite parents. But what was surprising to me is that the majority of respondents for both men and women were dual parents. They said, no, I share parenting equally. I'm equally engaged in parenting as my spouse. And I will say here 
Um, two, in all of these next slides that you're going to see, there we are only looking at um, heterosexual couples. We were hoping to have a larger survey response from homosexual couples, but um, we did not receive that. So we're really looking again at that binary with all of its flaws and looking at heterosexual coupleships uh, partnerships here. So we said, all right, you're dual parents. We have all of those shared parents. When are you most likely to be the primary caregiver? So we're trying to look at institutional policies, metrics. What time are you really engaged in parenting? And at all times of day, women were more engaged in parenting than men. So we thought, okay, but women are more likely to be lead parents. So let's break that up by lead, dual, and satellite. And indeed, we find that when men are serving as lead parents, they're more likely to be engaged or as equally engaged as their female counterparts in lead parenting. Of course, this only represents about 3% of the population. So this is a very small slice. But what we found interesting is that when women who said they were in shared parenting relationships they, and men who said they were in shared parenting relationships, women were disproportionately likely to be engaged at every time of day and to frankly be doing equal to the amount of labor and engagement when they said that they were a satellite parent. So their conception in some ways is undervaluing their contribution, but it also suggests that men might be overvaluing their contribution in terms of engagement. So we said, well, maybe time isn't the right unit of analysis. So we gave dozens of different activities and we said, who is primarily responsible for these activities? Now, if we look across this, women are almost in all cases more likely to be the primary caregiver for all of these activities. Now in lead parent, we see a few examples in school nursery pickup or school nursery drop off. But for all the other categories, there's only one activity in which men, male parents are more likely uh, to be engaged than women parents. And that's in coaching sporting activities. Now my dad coached me in all of my sporting activities um, and it does take a tremendous amount of time, but I would be hard pressed to say that that classifies as shared parenting or equal parenting. When women are both more engaged at all times of day and doing more of the activities than their other so-called dual parents. So again, we see this discrepancy in the perception of their contributions to parenting. Now, what I found fascinating about this was about a third of our respondents were in academic households. That is, they identified as an academic and identified that their spouse was also um, an academic. Now, we looked at only those who were in those dual shared parenting relationships. And so the idea of this was to control for different labor expectations because we don't have a dyadic pair here. We don't have the um, male and the female partner. All we have are people reporting on the status of their partner and their contribution. But we asked them, Two questions. I take on the majority of childcare so my partner can focus on their career, or my partner takes on the majority of childcare so I can focus on my career. And we found that men said, no, my partner takes on. And the woman says, no, I take on the majority of childcare. And these were in academic couples, in partnerships within academia, same labor expectations, but they admitted that women were bearing a larger responsibility, a larger engagement, a larger burden of childcare responsibilities relative to men, even those men who said they were in dual um, and shared parenting households, and even those with the same labor expectations. This has a penalty in terms of production. If you are a lead parent, male or female, you have a production penalty um, relative to the average. Now, dual parents see a slight increase in their productivity, but men see a much larger increase than women. Now, this goes back to, again, their perception of dual parenting, which may not empirically hold out. And then satellite parenting also is a significant gain for men and a marginal gain for women as well. So there's a correlation between the amount of engagement, the amount of time you're spending with your children, and the amount of time you're spending in the lab, and the amount of production that comes out of that. Now we also see effects on citation. So looking at all of the citations received from these individuals, we have factors associated with higher citation and lower. Higher, be male, take a short parental leave, have your partner coordinate play dates, don't be religious or celebrate holidays and be away as much as possible, right? And all of these indicators speak to the same thing, right? When you're at work, when you're traveling, when you're in the network, you're going to be more visible, you're going to have more access, you're going to be able to work more. If you have more than two children, you take a long parental leave, 
you're the primary or an equal caregiver, you help your kids with extracurricular or any variable that was really associated with having younger children was um, associated with a drop in citations. Now, this isn't to say that your work is less good or it's lessened in quality. It's again about visibility and utilization. Work is cited when people are aware of it. And if you are not out in the academic space, if you are at home with the children, it changes your ability to both promote your own work, to engage in conversations, to meet the other academic network. So we see a lot of these constraints coming from the socialization as women as primary domestic um, operators within their home. Now we've looked at childcare in this survey, but of course elder care and other kinds of domestic responsibilities come into play as well. All right, so then the pandemic happens, an exogenous shock, which in some way can show us and reveal some of these disparities that we're seeing here, certainly related to caregiving. Um, so what we looked at here were preprints, and all of you are probably aware of this dramatic rise in preprints over time. So we took all of these preprint archives, um, and we really wanted to understand whether the pandemic was having an effect on women's production. So looking at about 3,000 preprints and registered reports to also look at what science was coming out across 1.3 million authors. And we found a massive decline at the beginning of the pandemic in MedArchive. Now, Archive, which is largely physics and computer science, which has low levels of female contribution, stayed relatively static. BioArchive didn't see much of a hit. But in MedArchive, we did see quite a dramatic hit. Now, over time, we saw that that was most dramatically hitting our first authors rather than our last authors. Now, this has huge consequences. Our first authors are our junior scholars. They're the more vulnerable scholars. They may be early career scholars. And what we were saying is those were largely displaced during the pandemic, moving to middle authorships, losing publications. Our last authors saw a bit of a decline, but stabilized fairly quickly. Now, we also looked at the degree to which they were participating in COVID research, which was the best opportunity for us to understand how they were pivoting their research to new areas. And we find that women were significantly less likely to be doing research on COVID than men. Now, over time, we've been, modern, um, we've been monitoring this and we've seen different fluctuations. It's largely returned back to the levels that we saw before except there were dips that happened in different disciplines at different times, which sometimes speaks to the time that it takes to do work, the research life cycles that we see in different spaces. So I'm not sure that we're done seeing some of these exogenous shocks on disciplines, particularly those that require extensive data collection. We also saw another dip right when kids went back to school in August, which again suggests that women who are disproportionately associated with care responsibilities, who also teach higher teaching loads and tend to have higher localized service loads are being hit by all of that simultaneously. And the hit is, being, um, a, the hit is affecting their research more than anything else. So to sort of close on that, the pandemic amplified a lot of these pre-existing disparities. And I've been really impressed with what my own institution has done in trying to correct for these and to move past some of these disparities, but not to just create bridges right now, but to really reimagine how we create the institutions so that if another shock were to hit the system, we would be better prepared and to understand how our workplace created these vulnerabilities in the first place. So I wanna end on this, does it change what questions are asked? Many times when I'm talking about disparities, people say, okay, but isn't it good that women are in the home? Isn't it fine that students of color go and work for nonprofits and for governments and in other sectors? Is really research R&D, is that path the most important path that we can have? And does it have to be diverse? Does it matter whose hands are on the pipette, um, right? Isn't it good that we have diversity in the sectors of employment here? So I hear these kinds of questions a lot. So we try to look at this in a couple different ways to understand empirically what happens when we diversify the scientific workforce. So one of the data sets that we looked at was PubMed. And first we looked at the percentage of studies that look at male or female populations. So now we're not talking um, as much about the gender of the authors, but rather the sex that studied, the degree to which sex is taken into account, and then the sex um, that is taken into account. Now in biomedical research, sex is largely unaccounted for. It's not included as an analytic variable and they're not really looking at men or women. 
We've seen huge increases in clinical medicine and public health over the last few years in incorporating both sexes in. Now, this could largely be attributed to the NIH and other bodies that have mandated sex inclusion and including both sexes um, unless it, it doesn't make sense in terms of the research study that's being provided. Now, you may say that it's fine that we don't study in biomedical research, right? It doesn't matter what the sex of a cell is. Well, it does matter what the sex of a cell is. I hope that this audience um, is aware of that and understands that in terms of reception to stress, absorption of lipids. Um, and I think it's largely one of the explanations that from drugs withdrawn from the market, seven out of 10 of them have adverse effects for women. When we're not testing on women or taking women into account when we're creating different pharmaceuticals, that has adverse effects for the population. Now, as you would expect, there are certain disciplines that skew towards one sex or another. Fertility, for example, tends to be more female than male. Um, gynecology, more female than men. Neur neurology, more male than female. Um, but when we look at pharmacology, it skews male. Addictive diseases skews male. Physiology skews male. All of these disciplines were more likely to be studying men than studying women. So we overlaid this with our gender disambiguation algorithm to say, well, does it matter if women are the authors? And the simple answer is yes. Controlling for everything else, having a woman in first or last author significantly increases the likelihood that you're going to take sex into account as an analytic variable and that you will include female populations in your study. Having both a female as first and last significantly increases the likelihood that you're going to do that. So simply put, having women in the scientific workforce changes what we know about the female body. And given that that's 50% of the population and 100% of the birthing population, that seems pretty important. Now, I would hazard a guess that those things start to matter when we look at race as well. So instead of our studies, we've started to play with that. Let's look at the topics that have the largest proportion of people by certain races and ethnicities and certain feminization. And we start to see the same homophily in topic space that we sort of inferred from the Lancet data as well. If we look at those, for example, that have larger degrees of black scholars, they're more likely to look at racial disparities or African-American topics within the health sciences. If we look at those with Hispanic um, authors, we find they're more likely to look at Latino, English and Spanish, racial disparities as one of their topics of studies, disproportionately likely than other populations. So this suggests, again, that when we change the composition of the scientific workforce, we change what is known. And people are likely to gravitate towards those topics that reflect their own lived experience. Now, if none of those populations come into science, we don't understand those lived experiences. Now, in health, we see huge implications for that. But I would argue that that matters across all sectors, whether we're looking at the economy, whether we're looking at education, whether we're looking at our health and medical system. If you look at the topics um, by race and gender in the social sciences, we see the same types of things. Are Black scholars more likely to look at Africa, racial groups, gender-based violence in children, language literacy, identity in Latin America for our Hispanic scholars? And we see different things by at the intersection of race and gender in each of these spaces. So I know there's a lot on this slide, but the main takeaway is really to look again at that homophily in what is studied, the questions that are asked, are different based on who is in the scientific workforce. So I see that I only have one more minute, so I'll sort of move through these next slides very quickly. So there's a, a sort of a space right now around openness, that openness might make things more equitable. And openness is sort of the word du jour, it's open access, open education, everything is open. Um, but we also have to be careful of some of that openness and how it can perpetuate some of the biases that we see. Um, so I'll skip through this, but only to say that when we looked at data within Google Scholar, Microsoft Academic Search, and Mendeley to try to understand perceptions of images, we find that people were significantly more likely to see a woman and say that she was attractive and to see a man and say that he was professional. That has huge implications for hiring for the allocation of resources when your everyone is one Google click away from seeing an image of you and forming an opinion of how scholarly you might be, how professional you might be, which is in line with many previous studies that have looked at these kinds of biases 
in the academic workforce. We also have to look at open access and the disparities that that creates. As we start to get to APCs that are over $10,000, we're starting to create restrictions for who can be an author, right? And open access is supposed to be about openness, but it's opening for readers not necessarily opening for authors. So we have to challenge some of these new models of publishing, which have good intentions in terms of openness, but might make things, um, again, unequitable at the end of the day. Um, so we need transparency. Our institutions have to look for transparency. Um, we need better data sets that are more global. We need to open our post-evaluation systems, and we need fully open infrastructure. So. If you're interested, I can talk a little bit about our QSS flip um, because there are interesting stories there. But I will just end on this slide, I think, and then we can go into some questions. It is the notion that science should be fit for everyone. And I have this version, this picture of this crash dummy here because it was not until recent years that they actually introduced a female crash dummy. And that dummy was cast as five foot tall and 110 pound version of a male dummy. And it was only placed in the passenger seat. Now women are 17% more likely to die in an automobile crash and 47% more likely to sustain a serious injury than men. Why? Because cars weren't built for them. When they get into a driver's seat and they're not tall enough to sit over it, when the seatbelt doesn't go across their pregnant lap, they're actually non-compliant. Right? They don't fit the way the car was built. And we see that same thing in academia. We've created a structure that is fit for an ideal worker, an ideal worker who has a partner at home doing childcare, an ideal worker who can work evenings and weekends, a an ideal worker who can travel continuously. And when we create these kinds of things, we leave out those who don't have access to travel, either from disability or family or care responsibilities, those who can't work in evenings or weekends. Um, and when we create that ideal worker, it becomes an exclusion technique. So part of institutionalizing diversity within academe has to be reimagining who it's built for and how it's how everyone can fit within the mold of a scientific workforce. So I'll end here and just sort of leave this slide up. I think there are a lot of policy levels um, that we can look at and levers that we can pull in order to get to this institutionalized diversity, but I wanna make sure that we have time for a conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cassidy, that was wonderful. Um, at this point, we really only have one question that I see, which is Dr. Shikamoto mentioned names as a factor in gender disparities. How accurate are authors or editors in their actions of recognizing women's names, either in accepting manuscripts or citing papers? Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. So all of these data that we use, both for race and gender, we use disambiguation algorithms, which look at the proportion of people within a population who are associated with that. So Teresa being a female name, um, Emily being a female name, Gregory being a male name. My name, of course, is problematic. Cassidy is a boy's name. Um, so it, my, the gender disambiguation algorithm assigns me to the wrong gender. But what our argument is, is that's largely going to be the perceived gender. So someone who doesn't know me and sees Cassidy, if most of the people they've met in their life named Cassidy are also men, they're going to perceive me as being male as well. So we're going on the notion of representation that your framing for a gender is largely gonna be based on your own experience. So that proportionality is going to drive that perception. Thank you, that's great. So do you think things are changing for the better? Yeah, and I, I should have put that, that slide up. So we've kind of done the back of the envelope um, trajectory. If we just let this happen organically, right? Because people always say that if you just, you know, wait, it's just we have so many women matriculating. We have so many women in undergrad. We have women in grad. If you just wait, it's going to happen. But what we find is that attrition is still largely happening in disproportionate ways. So yes, we're having more women at those things, but we're also losing more women at each of the career stages and losing more people of color at each of these career stages um, than other populations. So when we've mapped it out, it's like 2250 of achieving gender equality in the sciences. And wow. as a mother of two daughters, I really don't have that much time to waste. So wow. I, I think that these are things we have to create actions around. It's not something that is organically going to happen within our lifetime. I think John Ryan, our Associate Vice President for Research has a question he's gonna ask you. 
please. I do, yeah, I was trying to type it into the Q&A and not succeeding. <laughs> Uh, so, Cassidy, I was thinking about this 2019 paper in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that you may have seen where they, they follow uh, scientists after the birth or adoption of their first child and found that 25% of men leave full-time employment in a STEM field, but 50% of women do. Um, so, and it, you know, I think that in many of the STEM fields, we've, we've fortunately seen a tremendous increase in women going into the field in the past two generations that seems like it's become a huge bottleneck or hurdle so i was looking at your policy suggestions and i uh haven't had a chance to really digest them but what do you think would be the one thing i mean i it seems like we need better child care or something but have you i'm, I'm guessing you've thought about this so what would be your suggestion about dealing with that yeah, so it's, it is amazing looking at um, the Council of Graduate Schools has done several surveys that are really illuminating in this regard of asking people why they're going into um, STEM fields or not. And women are largely replying that academe is not a hospitable environment to be a parent. Now, for me, I think, but it's the perfect environment. It has flexibility. It has all of these different wonderful things, but they're looking at the PIs in their lab. They're seeing the kinds of expectations for labor and work. They're also seeing primarily men as PIs in those labs. So representation is one thing that matters. And I talk about quotas and I'm a huge proponent of quota hiring in these things. But so they're looking at representation and they sort of create this construct that academe is not a good place to be a parent um, or academe is actually just not a good place to be an emotionally healthy individual, right? And so that's also a thing that's coming out. So again, I think it is recreating the culture of academia. It's saying we can't, um, we have to tell a story that it is hospitable, but we have to make it hospitable. So it's the childcare, it's changing representation at the top. It's addressing these inequities where we see them. It's reducing harassment um, within their lab. It's giving them opportunities to be mobile, right? It's all of these things where institutions can say, we see that you face additional burdens and hurdles, and we're going to create support mechanisms to overcome these. We're also going to change the expectations at our institution, whether it's around promotion, hiring, resource allocation, um, to understand how they might create host, um, hostile environments um, in terms of racing after indicators, racing after publications, thinking about having an 80-hour work week, this kind of cult of productivity. All of those things are deterrents for having a more diverse and comprehensive workforce. As expected, you had thought about that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So from the chat box, one of the other questions we have is, do you have initiatives you plan to start at Georgia Tech or started in Indiana that use this data for change? Yeah, I love that. So we've been working on a gender equity task force at IU, and I'm very proud of the work that has happened there. So our vice president for research said, okay, I want a task force and here's what I want. I want something that happens within a month that we start allocating resources, particularly focused at the pandemic, right? Who was most affected? Understanding that our, um, our women faculty and our faculty of color were most effective and providing bridge funding. And the response was incredible, how quickly we were able to provide resources for extra research assistance, for different grading assistance, for other kinds of assistance that people needed in order to keep their research production up while they were facing these other challenges. So we were able to do that. We also did a survey and instrumented that survey and sent it out. And so we have data from the institution saying, what are your barriers and what can we do to help? And then we're working on a long-term um, strategy for the institution. So I would love to take some of that when I go to Georgia Tech too. I'm I'm an evidence-based person. I like to have the data, you know, in front of me before I make decisions. So I think understanding those pressure points and the levers that are um, available for the institution. Great. So we have a question that is probably from a trainee since it says, how can we mitigate these issues as trainees? Mm-hmm. So I think that this is one of the places, I have this bucket here for researchers. And sometimes people come to talks like this and they think, oh, the system is broken, right? The system is bad, institutions are bad, peer reviewers are bad, publishing is bad. Um, and I keep telling them, but you are the institution. You are the peer reviewers, you are the administrators, you are the faculty, you are the PIs, right? You are the trainees yourself, you're working in the lab. And so we have to have collective action 
to make these changes. So I think when we're thinking about the lab, that's really where it starts in those interpersonal relationships. So we know that women are more likely to encounter authorship disputes and to report that they haven't received an equitable share just in being named on a paper or not. So PIs need to think about how am I distributing labor? Who's getting to do what? How am I talking to them about what they're doing? And trainees need to start having more open conversations with their faculty members. Here is the work that I did. What is the credit expectation? What's the labor expectation? Because right now it's all shrouded in mystery and it becomes this black box and people are almost as uncomfortable talking about authorship in the academy as people are talking about money in society. And I think we need to get over that, right? Authorship is part of your labor. You need to go in and say, what should I do on this paper? What's expected? How will I be acknowledged on the authorship line? What are the, my roles and responsibilities? And creating clarity around those expectations and clarity around the rewards, I think is a huge step in mitigating some of these disparities that happen because there's no conversation or dialogue or communication about it. Great. So I've noticed that Dr. Sri Ram Rao, who is our Vice President for Research and Innovation, unmuted himself a couple of times. So I think he may have a question. So I'm gonna hand it to him. Thank you. Some of it was me fidgeting around with it, so that's the mute and mute. But regardless, uh, uh, Dr. Sugimura, I want to really thank you for uh, taking the time to be with us today and uh, for accepting this and visiting us through Zoom. Uh, we, at some point of time, uh, would like to see you in person on our campus. Uh, so I, I will say this. I mean, first of all, what you're saying is the data was utterly fascinating. Uh, and those of us who are in leadership positions, especially men like us, uh, like me, we, we realize that so much more needs to be done. Um, and clearly a lot needs to be done as we are building the next generation workforce um, to eliminate both obvious bias that exists, the conscious and the unconscious bias and the perceived bias that exists. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I say that because in talking to a lot of men, they feel that much has changed already. They feel women are already on the rise and they, they feel that everything is fine. There are a lot who feel that way. Mm -hmm. And you ask women, it is entirely the flip side of that and, and rightly so, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. So in, in as much as we are trying to do things, I also think what helps is the small signs of early success, a little success mm. here, a little success there, which then yeah. galvanizes uh, for us to do more, right? So mm -hmm. have you experienced uh, uh, examples like that? What are the things on the ground that can be done off the bat that are easy to address? Uh, organizational change takes time, cultural mm -hmm. change mm -hmm. takes time. So how do we embark on that? And, and I do believe in, in the low hanging fruit, what is it that simple thing that we could do? Yeah, that's, it's an interesting question and I'm gonna to turn to sort of a higher level organization and that is the, the federal government. So for two years I was working in the National Science Foundation and I feel like the levers that funding agencies have um, are incredibly strong. So one of the best success stories that I've seen in the last five years was actually the mandate coming from the equivalent of the NIH within UK. And they mandated that institutions follow the Athena Swan recommendations and other things for having female PIs. And suddenly compliance went up to 100%. If you tie it to money, <laughs> compliance happens within, you know, within a second. And so I think that there's more that can be done. I think that we have those kinds of examples where if we change the incentive structure, whether it's around funding, whether it's around promotion and tenure, those are things that are you know, a keystroke that can suddenly have huge cultural changes, creating those kinds of policies um, have effects throughout the whole system. So I think looking at promotion and tenure documents at your institution is one place to start, to look at those and see, is there, are there ways that we can change the kinds of expectations or clarify expectations? Um, and would that create a, a more hospitable structure? So I think that there are things within your own institutions that can begin to address some of these. Thank you. So another participant question is, how can we get publishers to actually collect demographic data about authors and reviewers so we can more easily hold them accountable? 
Excellent. I love that question. So they're already collecting it. They're just not sharing it. And so I think what we need to do, particularly in the library space, is to advocate for the aggregation of that data and then the transparency of that data. So if you have enough publishers who are willing to participate in it, it can be aggregated to effect that it doesn't um, call into question any um, privacy issues or different access issues. And so being able to see that data in, uh, you know, at scale would be fantastic. And they all have it. They have it within their own systems. Um, it's just about making that data um, accessible for research and more transparent. Now, I think particularly as we move into other kinds of transparency mechanisms around peer review, that would be an amazing indicator for journals to make public, um, the kind of the degree to which their reviewers or gatekeepers are representative of their discipline. Excellent. So do you think this data will influence current deans and people who select graduate students in a negative way? They see this and they are afraid of choosing women for their programs because we may lead due to childcare. The participant, I'm thinking that most current boards are still made up of white males and their biases. Yeah, so I guess I'll, I have two answers to that. And one goes back to the, the own, own words of your, your VPR, right? So many men think that the problem is solved. And I think data at scale like this is really influential. I think being able to show people this data, they say, oh, wow, I mean, my lab is all female, but I didn't realize that I was an outlier. I thought I was the norm. Most people sociologically do think they're the norm. So showing them what it looks like at their institution, in their nation, across the globe, I think is really important. Um, then I'll go back to my quotas. I think representation matters. You have to change what the decision-making bodies look like. And sometimes you have to do that in very blunt ways. I wish that we wouldn't have to have quota hiring, but sometimes that's the only way to overcome some of these systemic disparities that we've had in our system before. People are very quick to say, oh, well, if you use quota hiring, that's not based on merit and science has to be all based on merit. And if you think that all the hiring in the past has been done on merit, I would encourage you to, to reconsider how those biases may have influenced the past composition of those boards. What we need to do now are radical shifts um, to recreate that composition so that it looks more like the workforce that we see coming in and the workforce that we want to have. Great. So based on your research, do the more remarkable differences related to gender and race disappear as scholars move along from junior to senior status? In other words, do we see more equity in people if they can just hold on for about 20 years? <laughs> we, so we do in some ways and in other ways we don't. One of the amazing survivor bias uh, studies, and I didn't show the data here, is on funding. So for men and women who've both been in the research system for over 20 years, their receipt of funding is equal. So for women who succeed, who survive, uh, they tend to be equally funded they tend to overcome some of these issues. But as you saw with the peer review thing, in many cases, they still receive those disparities, particularly because they are a known quantity in the field. So their gender and race is a known quantity rather than an unknown one. Um, so there are some places in which the survivor bias plays out, other places where we see sustained disparities. Okay, so you addressed this a little bit, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask this. What policy changes are you recommending to institutions? Is that I know you were involved with the NSF, but what can we do on a more granular, granular level rather than nationally? Mm -hmm. I think, again, looking at your hiring, right? Hiring has to be a huge thing. You have to have hiring before you can have retention. So addressing how you're doing hiring, thinking about hiring um, in more strategic ways, I think is really important. Maternity resources are really important. Thinking about how childcare um, is offered on your institutions. Um, and if it takes two years to get off a wait list for your childcare, that's too long, right? So you, you have to look at the access to childcare. Thinking about how you ensure that um, female faculty and faculty of color get integrated into networks is really important. So providing conference funding, providing mobility resources, um, allowing them resources to bring in visiting scholars, because in many ways it can be easier for them to bring in an international colleague than to go to an international colleague. Um, and then, of course, addressing harassment issues, looking at the culture of the labs and trying to think of ways that you can construct labs in ways that are more anti-racist, anti-harassment and anti-sexist. So I have two more questions so far. Um, 
what can academic libraries do to mitigate these disparities and include more diverse voices in the literature? Yes. Oh, I love this. So I, I have so many thoughts about doctoral education particularly, but I think it starts at undergrad as well. We see that a lot of the reason that students aren't getting research assistantships when they're going into these positions is they may not have had research experiences as undergrads, and they may not also have the writing experiences or the education um, in K-12 that has prepared them for a research career. And I think libraries have done amazing ways in opening up new resources for teaching how to be a good scholar, for having writing workshops, um, looking for literature. But I think in some ways we need to make sure that our um, programs that we're creating are both accessible and tailored to those who may have had very heterogeneous high school experiences um, in terms of getting everyone up to that same playing field. So we see that in doctoral education as well, that we have attrition within the population um, because the expectations, particularly around writing, are very different and for searching for literature. So I think libraries can think about more equitable programming um, in order to ensure that they're giving all future scholars the tools that they need to succeed. Great. Thank you so much. The last question that I see, so if anybody has any more, they need to type them in real quickly, is surveys of self-reports are often questioned as being biased. How do you look at this when you acquire your data? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you see that um, so strongly in the parenting data. And that's, I think, what struck me is there's both bias in it, but there's also perceptual differences. Right? We took at face value that a parent would be able to accurately um, reflect their degree of engagement in parenting. And what we found is that they weren't. Women were saying, I'm a shared parent. And then every response on the category was showing that they actually didn't have a shared parenting um, role. And we had an open-ended question at the end of the survey, and we received over a thousand long responses of these beautiful stories. And many of them wrote, wow, I thought I was a shared parent. And then I took your survey and I realized I do way more work than my partner does. And so they even started to go through and understand that cognitively um, they, were, they were perceiving their engagement in a very different way. So one is just that gap between their own perception and reality. Um, but then there's of course just you know, all of the kinds of survey biases that come in. So we have to take all of that um, with our knowledge of, of it being a proxy for reality, not reality itself. Absolutely. So somebody got in the last question, which is what about disparity of gender with first generation academics? Absolutely. So that was another big one that we saw in the survey of earned doctorates. So there are very few data sets bibliometrically where we have that kind of socio-demographic data. Um, but the first generation students, um, just amazing differences that we observed there in terms of their path towards a research career. So that's another population that we haven't been able to observe bibliometrically because we can't infer that data, but we definitely saw that on the survey of our doctorates, that it becomes um, a, a strong negative um, factor in terms of their um, probability of obtaining a research career. Right. So with that, I really want to take a moment to thank you for a wonderful, thought-provoking lecture, Dr. Shigemoto. I'm sorry that we're not in person because I think we would have great conversations around this lecture. And as I mentioned earlier, probably lemon bars. So we appreciate you joining this evening and to the audience. Also, thank you for joining us, asking great questions. I hope you have a lovely evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night.